Hello and welcome to episode two of uh, Let's Talk Brand. Uh, this is the first in Poland series of video uh, interviews with uh, world-class branding experts. And today it's my really great honor to interview uh, David uh, Avrin, one of the most uh, in-demand customer experience and marketing speaker in the world. Uh, David is also an author of uh, three books, uh, his latest, why customer live and what's more important and how to win uh, them back was named by Forbes as one of the seven business books entrepreneurs need to read. Uh, welcome to the podcast, uh, David. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And actually, I should uh, I think I should welcome you to Poland because uh, from what I know, you haven't had the opportunity to work on the uh, Polish market. And I, um, I hope we are going to change this. I would I would love to come and visit. I've had the great privilege, <clears throat> excuse me, of speaking all over the world, and even my books are, are translated around the world. I just got a copy, so as you mentioned, here's my my new one. Why customers the one. came out in Russian, really, which is great. Wow. I was I was looking at this thing. I don't know what this says, but actually, I do know what it says <laughs> because I I wrote it. But so a lot of languages <laughs> around the world. But um, I would love to come and and visit Poland and and speak to my marketing in my brand and my my business colleagues in Eastern Europe. Great. I, I hope this is going to happen. And I, I do really hope that we are going to translate your books into uh, into Polish um, as well. And uh, today, uh, unsurprisingly, I would like to talk um, about customers and customer um, experience. Um, and uh, I do like to start with, uh, with some definitions uh, because there is a lot of misunderstanding. Yeah. And, uh, Actually, my goal is to, to simplify all these complex theories. And so I would start with a quite easy question, I think, uh, for you. Uh, what is the difference between uh, customer service and customer experience? You know, it, it, it is a great question. I think a lot of people confuse the two. The two Customer service, you know, we've been talking about this for 30 years. You know, how well do you treat your customers? Um, do we smile? Are we kind? Are we... Customer experience is different. I think it's related, but customer experience is how we experience doing business with you. And the customer service is delivered by the business, but the customer experience is received by the customer or the client. And the question is, how easy are you to work with? How easy was it for us to find what we want? How long did we have to wait for the things that, that we wanted? Is it an experience that would, we would repeat? Now, a lot of people in my industry talk about creating wow experiences, right? That's the key, is to do something that's that makes your customers say wow. I don't, I don't think that's true. I don't think that mm -hmm. most of our business models lend themselves to wow. I mean, if you're, if you're selling an electronic part that goes into an electronic piece, into a device in a factory, there's not a lot of wow. But what you can do is be very easy to work with, easy to find what you want. <clears throat> As a company, being very accommodating when somebody needs something different or faster or better or smarter. Uh, we look at what's going on in terms of the shift to everything online. Does that make it easier for a customer to work with you or does it make it more difficult? Oftentimes what we're seeing right now is companies looking for policies and procedures to make life easier for them and their team. But if it makes it more difficult for your customers, then they're having a bad experience. And you know you can have the greatest company in the world, you can have amazing products, but if your customers have to wait for what they want, you're not so great. And it translates into a bad experience. And what we're finding is that how your customers experience doing business with you is a primary driver in whether they will do business with you again as opposed to great marketing, great slogans. It's really what other people say about you is more important than what you say about yourself. Okay, so even today you, you wrote on your LinkedIn page that it doesn't matter how great you are, if your customers have to wait too long of what they want, you are not so great. Right. From, 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 from today's... Um, well, you know what? Uh, you, you, people um, spend a lot of time and money creating great companies and great products and treating their staff well. And all of that is very, very important. But when somebody calls and they're on hold for 20 minutes, none of the rest of it matters. 
if they go to your website and they just have a simple question and there is no phone number, there is no way to talk to a real person, they get frustrated and they leave. Now, you know, my, my new book is, is called Why Customers Leave and How to Win Them Back because I hold up my book again. Um, and I get asked the question all the time, why, if you were going to say it in one thing, why do customers leave? And I say, you know why they leave? They leave because they can, because there are so many choices. And if you are make things difficult at any point along your customer's journey, then they'll just go somewhere else because they can, because there's so many competitors. And today, well, gosh, everybody's good. For the first time ever, I think in history, everybody's good. <clears throat> because if you weren't good, you wouldn't survive. If you weren't good, you would be outed on social media, right? Yelp and TripAdvisor and Rotten Tomatoes and Glassdoor. Everybody talks about everybody. And so today we talk a lot about social proof. And social proof is basically before somebody makes a purchase or makes a decision, oftentimes, most of the time, we go online and we look and see what other people thought about you, what other people said about you. Mm -hmm. And the reality is most people are not going to take a chance on somebody with bad reviews because there's somebody else with good reviews. I mean, it's just we have a whole world of choices. So today, as I speak to organizations, as I write books and I consult, I advise them to take a step back and walk their customer's journey. How easy are you to do business with at every point of contact? And, ask, and I ask the question, is that the way it should be done? I mean, it's the way you do it. It's likely the way your competitors do it or your industry. But could it be done better? or faster, or smarter, or more memorably, uh, or more uh, differentiated than others. You know, this pandemic, the COVID-19 has been very instrumental in and influential in making us think differently quickly to try and accommodate all of the restrictions. And so I think history will record this as a time of remarkable innovation, because we've had to be innovative. Uh, the question is, are you the same company that you were a year ago? If you wake up a year from now and you're the same company and you do everything the same, you will have missed a chance, a great chance to get better. Okay, so if uh, being great or, or, or just good um, is no longer a, a differentiator, is um, as you said, just um, just an entry ticket to the to the market. Exactly. Um, uh, so what are the most uh, effective or maybe permanent or I don't know if it's the right word, durable um, differentiators and how to find them? So well, if that one is fast, no one is fast. <laughs> right, right. But but here's the challenge is if you are just good, I mean, really good. As you said before, that's sort of the entry ticket today. You have to be good to compete because if you weren't, everybody would figure it out. So it really starts with, with taking a step back and looking at your business as your customers would look at your business and not necessarily looking for wow moments. It's great if we can have them. But to answer your question, those durable points of differentiation are things that make your customer's life better. We have gone from what we call product centric, product centric businesses is, is the way we've done business for hundreds of years. It means we are really, really, really good at what we do. Uh, we know everything about it. We're, we're very good at, at describing it. We're very good at manufacturing it or whatever we deliver. And we sell it to as many people as possible. And that creates market share. Absolutely true. Still true today. The problem is when others are also really good, then the marketplace, we kind of get numb. We don't we don't see any major difference. And then we're looking for the lowest price. So for those who are saying, you know, it's all about price, it's only about price when you're the same as everybody else. And price is always going to be important, right? But if there's nothing significantly different. So here's where the difference, what, what we're seeing is the shift is going, is companies going, smart companies going from product centric to customer centric. Now, don't confuse that with customer focused. We're all customer focused and we all want to please our customer. We know that. But it starts with being very good at what you do. That's required. But then saying our real differentiation is that we understand our customers on a deeper level. We understand what they really want. We understand what's hard about their day. 
we understand their journey and who they have to answer to and the pressures that they have and the, the, how busy they are. And if we're in a B2B situation, we understand who they report to and how they're being evaluated in their job so we can make them look good in their job. And it influences everything. So I think to look for those differentiators, those durable differentiators, is we first have to ask, what can we do or how can we do it differently to make our customers' life better, to make it easier for them, to get them faster, to say yes more often? And that's and that's a process. But the, but the companies that are doing that well, um, who, are, who are focused not just on being good, but on being easier or faster or smarter or more intuitive or more next level or next generation, those are the companies that are creating differentiation and are, are well positioned to survive when not every company is going to survive. Okay, but, but as, as you said, uh, the business leader or CEO, so whoever it is, uh, know exactly what's good for them, for, for their business. Um, how do we know what kind of experience uh, our prospects expect from us? Right. Well, here's what's, what's really interesting, Wokash, is, is that today, for the first time ever, we're being compared to companies that have nothing to do with what we do. We've always had to be one of the best in our category for whatever your category is in automotive or restaurant or retail or manufacturing. We had to be one of the best among our competitors. Well, today, for the first time ever, we're being compared against companies like they're saying, you know, people saying, so you don't know when the delivery is going to come. Really? Uber knows. Uber's right here. They're going to be here in 14 minutes. Why can't you do that? Well, Amazon delivers overnight. Alibaba can deliver. Why can't you do that? So to answer your question, I think we know what they want by looking back at every industry and every category and saying, what have people come to expect in terms of access, speed of delivery, accommodation, um, being able to um, ask for special orders, uh, special special timing or delivery or colors or anything else. Can we do that? Right. What had and the other thing is oftentimes your customers will tell you the problem is we're just telling them no. So how often do you ask your frontline people, the people who answer the door, the people at the front desk, the people who talk to your customers, what are your customers asking for that we don't do? What do we say no to? When someone says, well, can you do this? Yeah, sorry, we don't do that. Are they, are they writing that down? Are they sharing that with their superiors? So that we, there may be something that we don't do. We've never done it. But how do we know if there is sufficient demand for that to justify adding it? Maybe that's a new profit center for our business. But unless we have really good communication with our frontline, our frontline has to listen they have to document every time that they say no, every time they say, sorry, we, we don't do that or that, you know, we, we don't offer that. We got to make sure that we're writing that down and then we can look how often is that being requested? Because there are opportunities and we're seeing companies that are making big shifts, big pivots, because the way they used to do business isn't allowed, maybe during a lockdown or something else. So we've seen a huge rise in delivery, right, of groceries, of food. That's not changing. That's not going back. You know why? because we love it. It's great. So uh, we're seeing companies doing things that they never did before. I just spoke recently to the Middle Eastern and North Africa Shopping Center Association. So it's all the malls in Dubai and Abu Dhabi and Cairo and everything. And they were already seeing a decline in people going to shopping centers because we buy things online, right? And so their question for me was, how do we survive a pandemic when numbers were already going down. And I said, I think we do that by offering what online retailers do, which is delivery, which is curbside pickup. People in shopping malls never thought about delivery, right? We have to now. So it's doing all the things that they do, but also doing things that they can't, right? They can't allow you to try things on. They can't give you a personal experience and a concierge or a chance to connect you know, safely with others so that we can have conversations. So everything isn't shifting. We're seeing something shift back, but we're seeing companies expanding what they offer because they have to. And they do that by listening to their customers and watching other industries and adding new amenities 
new services, new products. Okay, so this, actually, this is a constant, never stopping uh, uh, work to, to f- because if everybody is super fast, it's uh, flexible. So then we are looking for something new, something which is going right. to be. So, so this. Yeah, but you know, the reality is everybody isn't super fast and everybody oh, isn't yeah. flexible. They should be, <laughs> and they won't all survive. It's the old book, you know, who moved my cheese? They think, well, it's going to come back. It's not going to come back. Somebody asked me the other day, they said, are, are things going to get better? And I said, of course they're going to get better, but it's a different better. Getting better doesn't mean it's going back to the way it was. And that's not a bad thing. It's an exciting time for those of us in marketing and customer experience because we're seeing new ideas and new innovations. I think in some ways this pandemic has accelerated what has long been predicted. We've been talking about this in science fiction movies and everything for 20, 30 years. We thought this was 10 years away or 20 years away. It's now. Look at you and I. We are on different sides of the planet and we are talking face to face. For my parents, this is magic, Wokash. This is magic. And for us, it's Monday, right? You know, I think it's a very exciting time. It can be scary for some, but there's really great opportunities. We're going to deliver in different ways. We're going to create different products and services. We're going to <clears throat> we're going to find ways to listen better, to document better. It's big data, right? It's cross-referencing data points. We're getting better through artificial intelligence of predicting based on past behavior. And the more things that we can add into it, the better we can predict. And it doesn't mean it's going to take the place of real people. But chatbots, when done well, and they're not always done well, um, help us find what we want faster, as long as there's also an opportunity to talk to a real person. Yes, right? exactly. <laughs> right? Artificial I, I, I was saying artificial okay, intelligence. Sorry. Decades ago, artificial intelligence was was, you know, computers gone crazy and taking over the world. Today, it's helping you buy a shirt faster. Yes, as long as there is a human inside as well, because I hate this chatbot way. I have to think how to uh, how to ask the question to get the right answer. And there's a, there's, a, there's lots of troubles with this. But OK, so agree. How to, how to how to stay human in this? OK, there's a lot of technology that helps us to. Um, to deliver information or to, 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 to find the right information. But sometimes then I feel there is no human inside uh, and people stop thinking this way. Yeah, it's, it's a big problem. Um, and I think you're going to see the pendulum swing a little too far before it comes back. And I think companies will realize that they've gone too far <clears throat> when they see their numbers down. They'll, they'll, they're they'll know they went too far when they see a lot of negative reviews on site, which can be death for a business, all the negative reviews. I was, and we're seeing that. We have one of our our large grocery stores in America and they fired most of their checkout people. They've added all those self checkout. Um, I'm not sure what the terminology is around the world, but the people who ring up your order. And so I was shopping and I've got a big family. I've got lots of kids and my, my shopping cart was overflowing with a lot of food. And I get to the front and the manager directs me to self checkout. And I have a card like this high. And I said, Oh, sorry, I don't work here. You know, I'm not trying to be, um, to be condescending. I'm really bad at it. I'm really bad at checking out my own stuff. I had too much food, but they would say, no, no, no. our, Our customers want choices. But it's not a choice when you have one person checking out and there's 10 cart carts in line and you have 24 self checkout. That's not a choice. It's social engineering. You're trying to get us to do business the way you want us to do business. That's where the problem is coming up. Well, right now is that we're seeing companies trying to with their their customer journey, their customer mapping, right, their journey mapping, mm-hmm. trying to get people to do business with them the way they want. And here's the problem. Your customers never read your employee manual. They don't know how they're supposed to do business with you. They just know how they want to. So technology is here to stay. Technology is going to get better. But don't stop listening and don't stop watching. And when you watch your customers and you see people in line going like this, ah, ah, you know, they're telling you that they're angry. 
And I, I had a guy who was doing an interview and he said, David, if we've been talking about this for 30 years, how could it be getting worse? I said, it's getting worse because we've gotten so focused on doing it efficiently, we've lost doing it personally. And people don't want to feel like a number. There has, we have to do cost containment. I get that. As a business owner myself, we have to be smart. But if you uh, put up a contact form on your website, instead of letting somebody talk to a real person, you're going to lose a lot of business. So I think it's going to, I think we'll find that balance, but I think it has to get really bad first. And I think it's getting really bad in many, in many cases. Okay. And then, then you, your customers leave. Okay. So then let's unpack your book, um, why customers leave and how to, uh, to win them uh, uh, back or, uh, Okay, so little advice from you. I know there's a lot of advices in your book, but um, sure. the most important one, two or three, how to win them back if they leave because uh, we yeah. missed something. Uh, uh, we missed that uh, market has changed um, and, uh, or we ignored something. How we can win them back? I think we win them back, first of all, by fixing all the problems that drove them away. We knew... 30, 40 years ago, you could have a wonderful restaurant and, and if the, the toilets are gross, you know, or dirty, then people remember a bad experience. Well, now it's everything. The problem is when, when you've already gotten to the point where you've lost people as a result, it's because there's problems that need to be fixed. Walk that customer journey, make sure there aren't unnecessary delays or points of frustration, everything else. Fix that. That's step number one. Um, step number two is to be very clear about what has been said about you online. This wasn't true 10 years ago. This wasn't true 20 years ago. Today, that social proof, positive or negative, can, can decide whether or not your business survives. So you need to be very clear on any negative comments that are, that are, that are put online. And then here's the, hard, the, the part that's really hard, is you need to contact anybody who's posted something negative and ask them, what would it take? What would it take to make this right? And that's really hard if you did nothing wrong. Some people are just unreasonable. And this is the hard part. It's having those conversations saying, what would it take? And sometimes they'll come back and say, I want this for free or what, whatever else. And, and, and the, my favorite line in all of business, even when the answer has to be no, sometimes the answer is no. For a customer you're meeting with right now, the answer. I love this line that says, let me tell you what I can do. Right. Show them that you're willing to do something and saying, if I'm willing, to, if I do X and Y, would you be willing to take down your negative review? And sometimes they will do that. It's, it's a really smart thing. You can fix everything. And if there's 20 negative comments online, nobody's going to care. They're not going to take a chance. So you've got to be able to clean up what's online the best you can. Um, and then and then the other one is is you have to uh, you have to create an army of ambassadors so everybody that does have a positive experience, we need to encourage them to say something nice. Um, we need to encourage, I saw a restaurant, this was great. So there was a restaurant that literally had <laughs> selfie sticks. As I, I lean back in my office here, selfie sticks collapsed in the center of every, of every table. I mean, basically telling people, if you're having a good time, get with your friends on your mobile phone and post something on Instagram or TikTok or things like that. Um, I saw another sign at a restaurant. It said, if, if, if something is wrong, please don't tell Yelp. Tell us. We will make it right. Social proof today is more important than ever. So the whole idea of getting, getting them back is first fix all the problems. Number two, you got to clean up what's online. And number three is for those who have positive experiences, encourage them to share it. You know, I saw I saw a car wash that as you were going into the car wash, the marquee said, um, take pictures and hashtag us, put it on social media. And when we see it, we'll give you a coupon for a free car wash next time. Right. It's encouraging people. It's rewarding people for the kind of behavior you want them to have. And so going through a car wash and there's all the different colors and little kids love going through it. And they're all screaming and singing in the car. And there is a fun in it and the, the, yeah. the game. So. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, everybody else is sharing how much they love you. That part's really yeah. important today. Uh, David, do you think we should, uh, as a business, uh, focus more on competitors or on clients? 
Um, I don't, I'm not sure I understand that the, the question. Okay, so I, I think what we have to do is we have to be very clear on who our competitors are because our competitors are our customers' choices. So they have all these exactly. choices. They're not deciding on us. So I think we have to be very clear on what our competitors offer, how they offer it, what makes them good, bad, and ugly. And we have to make sure that we're better in comparison because if they're a competitor of ours, they are also a potential choice for our customers. So first and foremost, we absolutely have to. I, I had somebody say to me once, they said, I'm not creating my marketing based on what my competitors are doing. I said, well, you have to. How else would you do it? You got to understand your, your prospective customers that are looking at everybody. They've got choices. So you have to look better than them. You have to be better than them in some way. And the hardest part is most of our competitors are very good. Most of our competitors are very good people. They're good people. They're just trying to support their family like everybody else. They're not enemies. They're really good. I hear, I hear, I hear people say all the time, you know what makes us different? We actually do what we say we're going to do. I'm like, do you really believe that? Do you really believe that your competitors are underperforming, that they're not very good? They're great. They're good people. Stop thinking you're so good. You're not. Everybody's good. But how are you better? So we, we've got to focus on our competitors just so we know. And then we have to be able to communicate it and deliver it effectively for our customers. So I think both are important. Okay, because I, I think today already my competitors satisfy my potential clients' needs. So yeah, of course. My, my, my prospects are at, <laughs> at, at you know, um, the competitors' Clients are my my potential clients. Yeah, but sure. so so that's why I ask if we should focus on the competitors and to to find a way to to draw them away. <laughs> yeah, we'll see that that part's really important. Well, gosh, it's we talk a lot about the challenges of customer acquisition, right? How do we acquire? I don't think that's the problem. I think most of our prospective customers or clients are already working with our competitors. Exactly, it's not acquisition, it's customer conversion. We have to convince them to stop working with our competitors and start working with us. That's hard. And we do that by make, being very clear of, with them of what they're not getting, right? Our biggest challenge in business is prospects, potential customers who are fine. We're fine. Oh yeah, but we're really good. Yeah, but we're fine. We, we're working with these guys. Yeah, but we can do this better. Yeah, but I like them, right? That's hard. And they're trying to draw people away from us. And so I think one of the biggest challenges we have with our own customers is that we um, we stop dating them, right? We're trying to get them. We do all these things for us. And a year later, we assume that they love us and they're going to be fine. And somebody else starts giving them love and then they're happy to leave, right? So all of that's important, but we have differentiations important, but we have to do it in a way that's honorable, we don't want to we don't want to trash and criticize our competitors too much. They're trying hard. But if there's something we can do different or better or faster or smarter, then um, then we've got the chance. We've got to we got to keep dating them throughout the whole relationship, just like with our husbands and wives. Exactly. Right. My wife knows that if I stop bringing her flowers, she's way too pretty and somebody else is going to start bringing her flowers. And that's not OK. <laughs> Okay, so, so like in business, there is kind of the game, stop working with these good people come to us and then the, the different company says the same, stop working right. with these good people come to us. And It's hard. Um, that's, that's why they do it by saying, come to us and we'll give you half price for the first three months. Or, And it works, but it only works if you're not being satisfied by your current company. So you always have to keep working to keep your customers happy. You can't sleep. You can't yeah. stay in a place. Okay. Oh, this is this is, a, this is true that there is um, too much of everything. The information, uh, marketing hype, uh, products are the same, exactly the same, and services are quite the same. Um, if you can, uh, at the end, give some uh, some advices uh, how to stand out as a brand on this uh, overcrowded market, if you could yeah. write in the recipe uh, for the success, what would it be? Well, first, I think we have to stop using the same words as everybody else. When we are product centric, let's go back to that. And we are focused on how good we are at what we do. 
we talk about our quality and commitment and caring and trust and people and our competitors talk about their quality and their commitment and their caring and their trust and people. Every single food service company in the world says that we start with the freshest ingredients. Well, you're serving me food. I mean, of, of course, it's the freshest ingredients, but it doesn't make a difference, does it? And so if we're looking to differentiate besides being better and being very clear about fixing the reason that customers leave from a marketing perspective, um, we have to not promote our competency. We have to not promote that we're just good at this. All that's important. But the, the most effective thing is to promote your differentiators, promote what's different, promote what's special, promote what you do that other people don't do. It doesn't mean that the other parts aren't important. They're very important your quality and commitment, all that stuff. It just makes you blend in with everybody else. So the real opportunities we're seeing is the people that, that focus on, on promoting parts of their business that, um, uh, that nobody else is doing. So promoting the, those special parts, those differentiators, that, that can be very effective. And then, of course, you have to live up to it. You have to be as good as you say, or the marketplace will figure it out. Okay, uh, thank you so much, David. Um, it was really a pleasure to have you have you here, and thank you for sharing your uh, knowledge. Uh, if you would like to, uh, at the end, invite people to follow you on your channels, or um, so, so so so, let's do it right now. Sure, absolutely. Well, they can um, follow me. It's it's David Avrin everywhere. For if you're watching the video version of this, you can see my name spelled A V R I N. On Instagram, it's the real David Averin because there's all of these fake ones as well. And you can find my books and everything online. And um, if you want some, uh, sign up for my list. We'll, we'll send you some great information. You can just text the word easy experience to 474747. I'm not sure if that works around the world with the different data rates and everything else, but just look me up online at <laughs> Instagram. It's, it's, at the real David Avern everywhere. It's David Avern. Follow me on LinkedIn. Um, and I hope to have an opportunity to, to meet you in person and to uh, and to share with my my Polish colleagues uh, sometime in the future. Yes, I, I do hope so. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you. One more time. OK, have a, have a great day. We have an evening now in Poland, but you have a, you have a wonderful morning. See you as well, my friend. OK, thank you very much. Okay, David. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you for the uh, the interview in the uh, in the magazine as well. I appreciate it. And yeah, hey, I, I would send it to you because I'm going to get it in a week time. I think so. Okay, I would send it. That's great. And, and the copy, and, and then we'll see how it's going to to end this this project because uh, we started with this with this podcast. It's quite it's quite stressful for me. <laughs> yeah, I think you're fine. I think listen, a lot of people doing podcasts. First of all, I thought you did a great job. I a lot of times they get really stressed about making sure it's perfect. I think the best podcasts are you just have a really good conversation and let people li listen in. You know, I, I think sometimes they talk over each other. I don't I don't think it matters. I think it just it's like a real conversation. If you and I were sitting in the same room together, mm -hmm. like the talk shows on TV, right, at late, late night talk shows. Um, some people are just they're so formal or they'll send me a list of all the questions and they're not listening to the answer. They just read the next question and then they read the next question. And it's just boring. So <laughs> so you're better you're better at this than you think. I do hope so, but this is the first podcast uh, in English in Poland. Uh, Good for you, no one ever before. Are you going to subtitle this? Or are you going to translate it? How are you going to do it? Um, actually, we're, we're thinking about this, uh, but the translation is quite quite difficult um, because it's not easy to, to do this translation. Um, it's a lot of work, I know, from, from, the, from the magazine Market Plus, uh, yeah. how much it takes to, to translate it. It's, I think we are going to leave it in, uh, in English. Yeah. I apologize that I don't speak Polish. <laughs> Do a little bit of Russian. Ja ocean rads from i Poznikomica. But that's all. It's not Polish. I, I don't speak speak Russian, but <laughs> my um my 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 grandmother's side was from from Poland or what they help me where this is. They I think they called it White Russia, like around the Poland Russia border. Like in that area, I'm not sure where that it was, but 
trying to think or Belarus, maybe mm-hmm. I'm trying to think where they were from. I know my, my, my grandfather's side was from uh, Ukraine near Crimea. So anyway, my father was first generation American. Okay. Uh, we, have, we have lots of, um, now I'm at the university and um, at the, the room. So uh, we, have oh, okay. students, we have a lot of students here from, from Ukraine and a lot of workers here in Poland from, from Ukraine. It's, it's, it's quite close. Yeah. Um, um, someday, us. someday I'll go to my, my grandparents' homeland, but they were all, it was, it was a bad time when they had to leave the country before the war and, and Jewish refugees and all of that. So kind of crazy. But all right, friend. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. One more time. I will let you know when it's going to be okay. going to be published um, uh, on the internet and promoted. Um, Perfect across the Poland. Okay. okay. Have thank, a good thank you. Thank have you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.